Joining us on the Informer is the chair of COSBOA, that's the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia. His name is Mark McKenzie. Mark, uh, welcome to the Informer. G'day, George. Um, what a tremendously difficult time we've had of uh, things. Small business has been challenged on so many levels. I mean, it's hard enough uh, at any time for small business, uh, but these are extraordinary times. Um, how have you found things and what is your read on the current temperature? How healthy is small business across Australia first? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. We tend to focus a lot on what COVID has actually done to small business. But for a lot of small businesses, they were starting to be hit about September last year, where we had businesses in regional Queensland and regional New South Wales that were hit by bushfires, that were hit by floods. We then had the catastrophic bushfires that occurred through the summer of um, 1920. And then we went into COVID. So for a lot of businesses, George, they've had a double hit. And I suppose in each of these circumstances, what you tend to do in small business is you rely on yourself. You get knocked down, you get up again. Um, but I think it would be fair to say that there are a number of business owners at the moment that are just really at the point of saying, can they pick themselves up for you know, an, another run at it? And the, probably the temperature at the moment, it's, um, there's a fair bit of anxiety out there at the moment about what the future looks like. Um, you mentioned quite rightly the bushfires. I, I, I forgot to, uh, to talk about them, but you're so right. Businesses, many of them, great many of them in those affected areas, really didn't have a chance to recover nor see business yeah. come back to them before the double whammy of COVID. Um, what do you say to them? Uh, what, as COSBO, as the, this council uh, of uh, organisations you come together to support, what have you been saying to them to keep their chin up? Well, I suppose two things. The first thing is we're riding with you through that process. So a number of us have small businesses. We work in industry bodies uh, that actually support small business and we're talking to government. And the second thing to say is the government is listening and has been listening for some time. All of the governments, state and federal governments. That doesn't mean they can necessarily do everything we need them to do. But we've seen a whole raft of measures that, to be honest, are extraordinary. If you think about forgiveness of business loans or deferral, we've seen forgiveness of payroll tax in some states. So we've got really a sense here where government understands that small business really is the engine room of our economy. Small and family business employ around 65% of all people that are employed in the workforce across Australia. They recognise that and the government is coming to the party. We'd love them to do more than they're currently doing, George, but I think when you start to look at it, um, we are having good results with government in terms of looking at the opportunities that lay forward. Uh, and as a result, you've got a government that's actually listening. That still means for all of us though, that the real challenge is how do we navigate, I suppose what I'd call, George, the unprecedented uncertainty. In small business, we normally deal with normal uncertainty. I'll put some money on the table and, and I start a business, I put my shingle up and I hope customers will come and, and they may or may not come. Um, whereas what we're dealing with now is unprecedented uncertainty, a once in a generation, once in a lifetime economic crisis and the risk that we've got this virus running around invisibly there that may result in government um, having to reinstall lockdown restriction measures that will impact my business in the future. Uh, that's not a scenario most small businesses have ever had to deal with. Now, that's the point I was going to touch on. Uh, this is now enforced. This is government enforced layoffs uh, and restrictions and stalling, which challenges you on a completely different level. Now, I'm excited to hear that there are some governments that have come to the party. Uh, we're talking about federal and state uh, governments uh, around Australia that have come to the party. But what are the banks doing? What are our landlords doing across Australia? Because I can imagine now you're at the airport, you've got a small business, you'd be absolutely um, dumbstruck with what's next. Yeah, I, and I think it, it's not just what's next, but it's also, you know, as a small business, typically I have a little bit tucked away for a rainy yep. day. Yep. But, but the fires and COVID-19 have meant all that's gone. I, my, the cupboard is bare. And so now I'm looking to rely on assistance that's provided for government through things like JobKeeper. And that, that has helped keep a number of businesses alive. 
we tend to focus on zombie businesses. Um, the best numbers we've got suggests that of, of about the, the 960,000 businesses that, re that registered for stage one JobKeeper, you know, there's probably about 18 to 20 percent of those that are zombie. But the big thing is that there's 80 percent that weren't and that aren't, and they actually can climb out through that process. Um, the banks, in particular, have been phenomenal. And I know we, we often in Cosbo, we're often belting the banks <laughs> for not being able to get good access to credit. But um, Anna Bly, Matt Common, who's the chair of the ABA, have been phenomenal. Um, They've worked with us around trying to understand what are the challenges that businesses, small businesses in particular, are dealing with. How can they actually develop products that are more fit for purpose than the products we've actually had to date? Uh, and I can say personally, um, certainly for the industry that I represent, um, I've had cases where I've brought a specific cases of hardship to the ABA and then had then been directed to the relevant bank and that business owner has had a fit for purpose solution that's actually been developed. I think the biggest challenge, um, George, really in all of this though, is knowing where to go, knowing how to access that. Because if you just walk into a bank and to your local banker, you'll tend to get some very generic advice mm. and that may not be in your best interests. And so to a certain extent, it's really about understanding what's out there. Um, and then you know, I suppose being a little, um, not so much pushy, but a little firm in going back to your banking advisor and saying, look, I've been here with you for a long time. I've been in business. There's nothing structurally wrong with my business. I just need some help to get through this low revenue period. Well, on that subject, uh, what, what about the landlords? There, there are so many small businesses and other retail businesses that would be feeling an enormous pressure and being pressured, I suppose, too. Uh, are there discussions? Are there negotiations? Is there movement? Is there an opportunity to find some common ground? Uh, maybe hit the reset button because as we, we spoke to, uh, to uh, Sandy Chong and she said to us that one of the greatest things uh, that she was observing was the model had been broken and they needed to hit yep. a reset button and go forward. Can you comment on that from that perspective? Um, George, that's probably the hottest issue for us at the moment. So if I think about the businesses that are coming out of COVID, I've had some that have actually done quite well. They tend to be located in suburban shopping centres and suburban high streets. Uh, I've got businesses that are, re are climbing out of it, but you know they've still got some work to actually do. And for them, finance and rent are significant issues. And then I've got businesses, particularly in CBD precincts, where no one's actually going to the city. So they're not buying the coffee, they're not going to the restaurant, they're not getting their hairs cut, hair cut. In those locations, I'm paying very high rent. And I've actually got a landlord who is probably a bigger landlord. It's not a mum and dad investor. Uh, they've got loans at the bank. And so you've got this supply chain of, I've got a tenant, let's just say it's a hairdresser in a CBD location, um, that can't afford the rent because the customers aren't coming in. So they go to their landlord to seek a concession in rent. And we've got some federal um, rules in terms of the commercial tenancy code that provides mechanisms for me to be able to negotiate that. But then the landlord has generally taken finance from the bank to be able to um, meet their requirement to own the premises. And so they also have to be careful that they don't violate the covenants with the banking um, industry, where effectively by giving me a concession in terms of my rent, it devalues their building and they then trigger some problems in terms of their loan arrangements. And so this is a really complex issue that has not yet been solved. Um, and so we have a situation where I, as a small business owner, am looking to get a rental discount, not for three months, but, but for the next 12 to 15 months. And within that context, while I might have a bit of goodwill from the landlord, they're actually saying to me, well, my problem is I've got a loan with the bank where I've not got forgiveness. I'm potentially going to end up as a result of giving you a discount and the other tenants a discount, I'm going to result in a, in a means of inadvertently devaluing my property and then violate the covenant of my loan. Now there's a very active conversation going on at the moment um, with the banking industry and with the property council and the property industry to see how we solve that problem. But I'll be honest with you, George, it's, it's a really complex problem. Uh, and really, for me, sitting there as a small business, I'm just looking for a discount on my rent. Um, there's not 
Well, there's lots of conversation. There's there's not a solution on the horizon just yet. Well, uh, Mark McKenzie uh, from Cosvar has been talking to us about the challenges that small business and retailers have been facing over the last year or so. Seriously complicated um, challenges. And uh, as we touched on earlier, I've always been a great believer that there is a way to find common ground. We've got to look for it. Some of that assistance that you were talking about the government's been providing is going to run out. So what happens next? What are we looking forward to? And from the point of view of landlords, I've always, I've always believed that it's better to have 40% of something than 100% of nothing. We don't want businesses to fall over. We don't want us, the businesses to close their doors and never come back because it's not as if they weren't viable businesses. This is all artificially driven and, and we understand why because of a major health emergency. But my goodness, as you say, there is a converse, conversation to be had. We need to t keep talking. Absolutely, George. Uh, Mark McKenzie, thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, we hope uh, at some stage over the next week or so to catch up with Peter Strong and see if that conversation has been moving on because as the CEO, I bet he's doing some elbow work at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely, he's, uh, he's working really well for us and, and I mean, you're probably seeing him in the media, but that's really the tip of the iceberg in terms of him putting pressure on a whole range of players, including banks and landlords and government. Um, so he's doing a great job and I think it'd be worthwhile catching up with him. Oh, well, thank you very much for that, Mark. Put a good word in. And for us, it's all about sharing the risk and moving the, the conversation forward. Yeah, that's great, George. Thanks for the opportunity. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Mark.